what are your theories on these five strangest unsolved disappearances? In 1998, Lenny Dirickson was having breakfast with his son when an unidentified man inquired about a horse Lenny had for sale. Lenny left with the man, but failed to return home. It was later revealed that Lenny had never advertised he had a horse for sale, leading to many unanswered questions. On March 14, 1998, 39 year old Leonard Lenny Dirickson and his 16 year old son Jared started their Saturday morning off typically as they ate breakfast together at Larry's Dairy Farm near Cheyenne, Oklahoma. At 9 a.m., as they were eating, a visitor arrived unannounced in what Jared described as a white pickup truck. Lenny went outside, and Jared watched his father interact with the stranger from inside the house for several minutes, and while he sensed no history between the two, their conversation seemed friendly. The stranger was described by Jared as a Caucasian male with a full, reddish beard, who wore a baseball hat with the words No Fear printed on the front. He appeared to be in his early forties, above six feet in height, and around 210 pounds. Jared pointed out that he didn't get a very good look at him, otherwise. When Lenny returned, Lenny told Jared that the man inquired about the sale of one of Lenny's stud horses, and expressed interest in seeing the animal. Before leaving with the man, Jared says that his father last said to him, so he told me that he was gonna go with him. He said to stay here and, get some feed and go feed the cows, and he'd be back that afternoon. Lenny was to travel to Elk City, Oklahoma and to Mobiti, Texas that day, though Jared didn't know which would be their first destination. Lenny was to return later that evening, but never came home. Jared waited until the next morning until he and his family reported Lenny as missing. Upon a thorough search of the house, investigators discovered that Lenny left his uncashed paycheck at home but had had $150 or possibly less on his person the day he disappeared. Investigators later revealed that Lenny never advertised a horse for sale. Upon searching the property where Lenny kept his stud horse, investigators discovered that Lenny failed to arrive there that day. Every possible lead failed to turn up any valuable information, police have found no signs of a struggle, no evidence of foul play, and no body. The possibility that Lenny left on his own terms, according to Jared and his family, is unlikely. Lenny was struggling around the time of his disappearance, both financially and emotionally. Lenny was facing hard financial issues. He was in debt, his credit cards were maxed out, and his dairy farm business folded months prior in December of 1997 because of plummeting prices. He had also recently gone through a painful divorce in 1996 that splintered the family with a bitter custody battle over Jared and his younger sister. However, Lenny's family is insistent that such behavior would be much unlike him, and that they firmly believe that he wouldn't have abandoned his family. Jared said, Me and my dad, we was together every day. Every morning, we'd go work, do the chores, and I'd go to school. I don't think he would have ever left me and not ever come back to see me or nothing, cause, we was close, and I don't think he'd have ever done that to me. Lenny was also employed at a local metal company since January, and his family claims that he enjoyed his work so much that Lenny's father was considering buying the company for him shortly before he disappeared. Shortly after 9am that morning, a waitress claimed to have seen Lenny and another male individual eating breakfast together at a local coffee shop. Cliff Gann, an inspector for the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, says of the sighting, they were sitting there in the restaurant. And the unknown man that we're trying to identify was doing most of the talking, and Leonard was just drinking coffee and listening to the man talk. The eyewitness description of the man matched that of Jared's, and according to the waitress, there was nothing suspicious about the man's behavior. Six months after his disappearance, a man phoned police claiming that he saw Lenny in a bar in Amarillo, Texas. He was able to describe the man in detail over the phone, but refused to give his name, remaining anonymous. By the time local police arrived at the bar, both the caller and the man he claimed was Lenny Dirickson were gone. The following day, 
police interviewed the bartender who had been working there that night, who corroborated the caller's story. Apparently, she remembered the caller being at the bar, but had no other information. Cho Hay, the county sheriff, said about the incident, we had no reason to disbelieve it. It would almost stretch the imagination that a guy would dance around in a bar screaming and hollering, it's Leonard, it's Leonard, and it not be Leonard. I believe he was in the bar in Amarillo. Twenty years later, Lenny's case remains unsolved, and his family is still holding out for answers as to the whereabouts of their beloved father, son, and friend. In 1993, a mother and daughter returned home to find their husband and father, David Glenn Lewis, missing. Hours later, a deceased hit-and-run victim was found thousands of miles away. It would take 11 years before the victim would be identified as David Glenn Lewis. How did he get there? A very long post where some of the how is known but none of the why. There aren't a huge number of sources available for this convoluted case so I hope everything is accurate. There's some jumping between timelines and investigations but fingers crossed it's still possible to follow. Disclaimer, I'm not American and am unfamiliar with all places involved in this case. I've done searches to familiarize myself with distances slash travel possibilities but any further insight would be great. When David Glenn Lewis' wife and nine-year-old daughter returned home from a weekend shopping trip to Dallas on January 31, 1993 and found David missing with freshly made sandwiches in the fridge, they had no idea that across the country David was hours away from being found as an unidentified John Doe. The man had been seen walking down a Washington highway before being killed in a hit-and-run. Though the hit-and-run victim's identity is now known and his cause of death well established, questions remain surrounding why David Glenn Lewis headed to Washington that weekend, and several other puzzle pieces regarding David's last movements continue to be up in the air. The Background David Glenn Lewis was born in Borger, Texas in 1953, the second of two children to Herschel and Esther Lewis. David graduated from high school in 1972 and from there went to Texas Tech University where he was an honors student and graduated with a degree in political science. David continued on to Texas Tech University Law School, gaining a doctorate in jurisprudence in 1979. David practiced as an attorney in Amarillo, Texas, and was a member of the American Bar Association. He married his wife Karen in 1981 and their only child, a daughter, was born a couple of years later. David was a member of a local church, a Sunday school teacher, a member of the director's board for the Dumas Community Education Advisory Council and a district chairman involved in the Boy Scouts of America. David was said to be a dedicated family man and charity volunteer who was close to his parents and brother. David Goes Missing Super Bowl Weekend of 1993 David's wife and daughter headed from their home in Amarillo to Dallas, around 400 miles away, for a weekend of shopping. They departed Amarillo on the 28th of January, leaving David at home alone for the next couple of days. It is known that David was last seen alive on the 30th of January, but where and by whom has not been revealed. On the 31st of January, the day of the Super Bowl match, David's wife and daughter returned home from Dallas. Expecting to find David waiting for them, they were surprised when the man was nowhere to be found. The tape recorder had been left recording the match, though it had continued to run after the match had finished. Two freshly made sandwiches were found in the fridge. David's wedding ring and watch had been placed on the kitchen counter. One source claims David's tape recorder had no preset function and so he would have had to manually set it to start recording on the 31st. I can't find another source which confirms this but something to keep in mind. There were no signs of a struggle or anything disturbed in the house that would point towards burglary or foul play. It appeared as though David had simply slipped out for a while. Due to the match and the tape recording, David's wife believed David may have gone to a friend's house to watch and would return soon. However a day later, the 1st of February, there is still no sign of David. 
David's wife goes to the Amarillo Police Department to report her husband missing. 1,600 miles away, a body is found. While David's wife was reporting him missing in Amarillo, at 10.30 p.m. some 1,600 miles away in Yakima County, Washington, several people spotted an individual on Route 24 near Moxie, several miles from Yakima Airport, the exact location is unclear. NB1 source claims the individual was lying down by the road, while another claims he was walking along the center of the road, but either way he was somehow along the road in a precarious manner. Motorists turned around to stop other drivers to warn them of the individual, but when they turned back they found the individual deceased. Police arrived to find the body belonged to a middle-aged man. He had been dressed in military-style clothing and work boots. An examination found no traces of alcohol or drugs in his system, from those that were tested for. Investigators believed him to have been the victim of an accidental hit and run. A Chevrolet Camaro was seen leaving the scene around the time of his death. The man had not been carrying any identification when he was killed, and his identity was unknown. Unaware of the discovery, the investigation into David's disappearance continues. The day after John Doe's body was found, the 2nd of February, the investigation into David Glenn Lewis' disappearance in Amarillo heats up when investigators find David's car. The Red Ford Explorer had been found outside the Potter County Court's building downtown. Under a mat on the floor, police found David's house and car keys. His checkbook, credit cards, and driving license were inside the car in the usual place David kept them. With the recovery of these items along with David's wedding ring and watch which were found in his home, none of his personal effects were missing. The discovery of David's car and these items have given police no real answers. The investigation does, however, lead police to an interesting piece of information. Some time before his death, David had informed his wife that he believed he had been in danger. He wouldn't, however, tell his wife any information about the threats he believed to be on his life or what the cause of the danger was. David's family believed his disappearance may have been linked to his work as an attorney, a disgruntled client or individual who held David accountable for something that happened as the result of a case and wanted to exact revenge on him. David was due in Dallas a week after his disappearance for a deposition in a conflict of interest case between his former law firm and a wealthy client. David had told his father that he had no intention of covering up any wrongdoings by his former firm and was going to tell the truth, whoever it hurts. These possible leads, however, went nowhere, and it wasn't until later that investigators made their most significant discovery two plane tickets purchased in David's name around the time of his disappearance. The first ticket, purchased on the 31st, was a ticket from Dallas to Amarillo. Interestingly, this is the same journey David's wife and daughter made on the same day, when they returned home to find him missing, how the two got home from Dallas themselves is unclear. The second ticket, purchased a day later on the 1st of February, was a ticket from Los Angeles International Airport to Dallas. This is the day John Doe's body was found in Washington. The intention behind the plane tickets is unknown, and it has not been revealed whether they were used. Did David intend to use them? If so, how did he get from his home in Amarillo to Dallas, a five-hour car journey away? Did he intend to return home from Washington to Texas before he was killed, using LAX as a stopover? And if that's the case, why did he go to Washington in the first place? With no more leads materializing, the criminal investigation into David's disappearance was closed after 11 months. In 2002, police told local press that the plane tickets purchased in David's name around the time of his disappearance led them to believe David left home of his own accord and they did not suspect foul play in his case. No other leads were forthcoming. A positive identification, but no real answers. In 2003, ten years after John Doe's body was found in Yakima County, a Washington Patrol detective named Pat Ditter read a newspaper series entitled Without a Trace About Missing Persons Cases. 
Ditter, a stickler for detail and a dedicated detective, read in the series about the flaws in missing persons investigations and particularly flaws in the N6 National Crime Information Center computer system at the time. Inspired by the thought that possible identities for unidentified victims may have fallen through the cracks of computer databases, Ditter took to Google and inputted characteristics related to about a dozen cases hoping to find missing persons cases that matched their descriptions. Within a week, police finally had a breakthrough, a list of potential victims who roughly matched the description of the Yakima County John Doe. One in particular, a Doe network entry for David Glenn Lewis complete with a picture of the missing man, caught Ditter's eye. The picture of David was strikingly similar to one Ditter had of the John Doe, though he was put off by the lack of glasses on the John Doe's body. After looking into evidence found alongside John Doe's body, Ditter discovered that a pair of glasses had in fact been found. Ditter went to access the personal effects found with John Doe's body and was able to find the glasses, wrapped up in the military-style clothing he had been wearing when he was killed. Now believing the connection between John Doe and David Glenn Lewis may be more than a coincidence, Ditter got into contact with Amarillo police. He later sent them items that could be used for DNA analysis, one of the boots the victim had been wearing, and a tissue sample preserved since 1993. David's mother Esther provided her own DNA sample to test against the unidentified man. In October 2004, 11 years after he went missing, David Glenn Lewis was positively identified as the deceased man found on Route 24, 1,600 miles from home. It is unknown why David would have headed to Washington, and nobody has been able to offer any insight into a connection he may have to the area. Though John Doe has his name back, many questions still circle surrounding what exactly happened to David Glenn Lewis that weekend and how he ended up in Washington. Though police had stated before his body was identified that they believed David went missing of his own accord, David's assertions to his wife that he had been in danger, his demeanor as a loving family man, and the nature of his job as an attorney have David's family convinced that he was the victim of kidnapping or foul play. Ditter believes David's death on the road in Yakima County to have been an accident rather than suicide. Nobody is able to provide any answers as to what would lead David to Washington a state to which he had no ties. The nature and motivations behind the plane tickets purchased in David's name, too, remain a mystery. On September 11, 1990, a Peruvian Boeing 727 with 16 crew members on board went down off Newfoundland, Canada. In a distress call overheard by two other aircraft, the pilot of the doomed jet reported that they were low on fuel and preparing to ditch. But no trace of the plane was ever found. The Haunting Story of OB-1303 The plane in question was a three-engine Boeing 727 passenger jet registered as OB-1303, which was owned by an airline called Fawcett Peru. Fawcett mostly operated within the Peruvian domestic market but it also leased some of its aircraft to airlines overseas. During the summer of 1990, Fawcett leased OB-1303 to Air Malta in order to help that airline fulfill increased demand during the holiday travel season. After a summer working routes in Europe, the contract concluded in September 1990 and the plane was due to be returned to Fawcett, Peru. However, the Boeing 727 is not a long-range aircraft, its fuel capacity limits it to intracontinental flights. To get the plane from Malta to Peru, it had to make stops for fuel in London, England, Reykjavik, Iceland, Gander, Newfoundland, and Miami, Florida. This rather lengthy return journey necessitated the carriage of several extra crew members, which is presumably why there were 16 people on board although no information about their identities is readily available. One source states that some Fawcett pilots who had been working in Malta were returning with their families in tow. The flight manifest indicated that there were 18 crew members, while Fawcett Peru reportedly stated that three of them never boarded the plane when it left Reykjavik, resulting in a total of 15 occupants. News sources at the time quoted this figure. However most sources that provide statistics on plane crashes, 
such as ASN and the BAA claim that there were 16 occupants, which doesn't align with either of these scenarios. Around 1.16 p.m. local time, source, on the 11th of September, OB-1303 departed Reykjavik for the third leg of its five-leg trip from Valletta, Malta to Lima, Peru. The destination was Gander, Newfoundland, a common stopover point for airliners in the days before larger and more fuel-efficient jets made direct flights between Europe and North America possible. The distance between Reykjavik and Gander was approximately 2,500 kilometers, comfortably within the Boeing 727-200's maximum range of 3,570 kilometers. Records showed that the pilots took on six hours of fuel, approximately equal to the international standard, enough for the flight plus two hours extra. Very little is known about what happened to the plane after it left Reykjavik. However, in 2006, a user on the Peeprune Aviation Forum, a site popular with aviation professionals, responded to an inquiry about the flight, claiming to have worked as an accident investigator for the Canadian Airline Pilots Association at the time of the incident. He said that according to documents provided to him at the time, the 727 began to deviate to the left, south of the appropriate heading of 234 degrees almost immediately after takeoff, an assertion which is corroborated by contemporary news reports. By the time the plane neared Newfoundland, it was hundreds of kilometers off course, and after about four hours, the point at which they should have been arriving in Gander, the plane was somewhere over the North Atlantic southeast of Newfoundland, out of range of any air traffic control center on VHF radio. Although HF has much longer range than VHF, the aircraft was not equipped with an HF radio at the time. It also would have been far out of range of any ground-based navigational aids. As this was before GPS, the crew could not have known their position with any certainty, and as they were unable to raise ATC on any frequency, a rising sense of panic must have filled the cockpit. However, the crew did have one final means of communication at their disposal, the guard frequency. Guard is a standard radio frequency typically used for emergency communication, and most commercial aircraft have one radio monitoring guard at all times. The crew of the Fawcett 727 began to call on guard, and their messages were picked up by the crews of a TWA flight and a United flight which were in the area. According to the pilots of the flights who spoke to the doomed jet, the 727 crew knew they were off course and were somewhere southeast of Cape Race, the easternmost point of Newfoundland. At this point, with approximately two hours worth of fuel left, the plane should have been able to make it to St. John's, if not all the way to Gander, but the crew's weather radar showed a line of severe squalls directly between their assumed position and the Canadian coast. According to the Canadian investigator, some time after the original flights that had been speaking with the 727 flew out of range, the crew made contact with another United flight which had entered the area. The crew of the 727 told the United crew that they were at 10,000 feet, headed southwest, and had received a low fuel warning. They advised that they did not think they could penetrate the severe weather and were preparing to ditch on the open ocean. This was the last communication from the ill-fated flight. The contents of their final message leave a couple of important questions. The low-fuel warning makes sense given the amount of time they had spent in the air at that point. The plane had six hours of fuel, it left Reykjavik at 13.16 Universal Time Coordinated, and the final distress call was heard at 18.50, approximately five and a half hours later, right about when the plane should start warning the pilots about low fuel. By that point they should have landed an hour and a half ago and were almost through their safety buffer. The question is, if they knew they were in an emergency situation, why didn't the crew attempt to penetrate the squall line and go for a landing in Newfoundland? I would speculate that they were worried about running out of fuel while on the squall line as they did not know their exact distance from Newfoundland and could not be sure that they had enough fuel left to reach any airport. In such a situation, they must have decided that if they had to ditch either way, it would be better to do it away from the storms. However, the conditions at that time were not favorable for a ditching. A ditching is easiest on calm water, 
and the North Atlantic is notorious for being the polar opposite of calm. Even though skies were clear in the area where the plane is presumed to have ditched, there was a stiff breeze of 10 to 15 miles per hour and the ocean surface was covered in heavy swells. According to a news report at the time, the wind was out of the southeast, which explains the pilot's decision to head southwest. By ditching perpendicular to the wind, they would hopefully land parallel to the wind-driven swells in order to increase their chances of keeping the plane intact. Presumably within 10 to 15 minutes of that final distress call, the crew ditched the plane in the Atlantic several hundred kilometers southeast of Cape Race. Given the terrible surface conditions, the chances of a successful ditching were extremely low. Ditching procedures instruct pilots to land parallel to the swells, but on the open ocean it can be impossible to tell in which direction the swells are aligned even if the wind direction is known. Most open ocean ditchings in history, almost all of them in much better conditions than this one, ended with the plane digging into a swell, cartwheeling, and breaking apart. That is almost certainly what happened to the Fawcett 727, and if anyone survived the initial crash, possible, perhaps even probable, given the low speed of the aircraft, they would have quickly drowned in the heavy seas or succumbed to hypothermia. Even if the plane did come to a stop intact, the probability of rescue for the occupants was remote. No one knew the plane's exact position, and in heavy seas it would have been extremely difficult to deploy the rafts and get everyone into them. And even if they did deploy the rafts, a few hours on the North Atlantic would carry them far from their original position, where searchers would be unlikely to find them before the heavy seas caused the rafts to capsize or sink. Personally, however, I doubt they managed to deploy any life rafts. As soon as Canadian authorities received word of the missing plane, a major search and rescue operation was launched. According to contemporary news reports, searchers had only two pieces of data to work with when attempting to determine the plane's position, a single hit from a satellite over England, and a partial radar track from the onboard radar of another plane that was in the area. However, these two radar hits were nowhere near each other, forcing searchers to cover an area of 40,000 square miles of ocean. Although a few signals that could have been the flight's emergency transmitter beacon were detected, searchers were unable to find the airplane or its crew, and after several days the search was called off. To this day the plane's exact final position is unknown, sources that I've found all agree that it was southeast of Cape Race, but distances used in various sources include 290 kilometers, 333 kilometers, 463 kilometers, and 658 kilometers. Normally when a plane goes down in international waters, the investigation becomes the responsibility of the aircraft's state of registry, which in this case was Peru. However, in 1990 Peru was in a state of great instability. Peru's new president Alberto Fujimori had come to office little over a month earlier and was fighting both currency hyperinflation and a Maoist insurgency that was wreaking havoc in the countryside. Amid the chaos, Peruvian authorities never followed up on the relatively minor distraction of the missing 727, nor did they ever request that Canada take over the investigation. As a result, no investigation was conducted and no official report was ever published. The plane still has not been found to this day, although the aforementioned Canadian investigator stated that a few tarpaulins believed to have come from the plane washed up in Newfoundland some time after the crash. And that's where the story ends. This analysis includes something like 99% of the information readily available on the internet about the disappearance, with a considerable helping of my own analysis on top. Many of the questions about what happened have speculative answers, but how it all started and why will probably never be known. Why did the plane fly on the wrong heading immediately after takeoff from Reykjavik? Why didn't the crew notice until several hours later? Was there a fault with their instruments, or did they make some sort of error? What might have taken place on board the plane in its final minutes? Here we have no basis even for speculation. As dozens of other plane crashes throughout history have demonstrated, they could have gone off course for any number of reasons. Today, we're left with a disturbing mystery with little hope of resolution, 
which must be especially hard for the families of the 16 victims, who will spend the rest of their lives wondering what took place aboard the doomed airliner as it sank to meet the siren song of the inscrutable Atlantic. A ship is found adrift in the North Sea, covered in blood, partially burnt out and with no sign of its crew. A lone survivor is found in a life raft with suitcases of cash and keeps changing his story. What happened on the barbel? North Sea, 1993 27 years ago tomorrow, the small coastal transport ship Barbel set off from London with a cargo of rapeseed bound for Rostock in northern Germany. Barbel was a fairly modern ship for the time, her keel had been laid by Dutch shipbuilders Scheepswerf Damon Gorncham in 1986 and was completed and delivered to owner and Captain Heinrich Telkman in 1989. A contemporaneous report from the Hamburger Abendblatt newspaper can give a brief overview of the likely events between the final sighting of the Barbel's crew and the discovery of the lone survivor, 28-year-old Russian sailor Andre Lapin three days later. On Sunday, August 15, 1993, 50-year-old Heinrich called his wife, also named Barbel, he named the ship after her, at approximately seven, telling her that the ship had reached the mouth of the River Thames and that he should be back in Germany by that evening. When he did not arrive home, Barbel attempted to call Heinrich on Monday, but there was no response. It was not until 10.45 on Wednesday, August 19, when Danish fishermen aboard the HG270 Tannisbug and HG271 Normark found two life rafts, one was empty, and the other found by fisherman Soren Larsen contained Lappen. The Barbel itself was found later and the reason for the lack of communication become clear. On board, there was a great deal of blood about the ship, particularly in the ship's workshop, which someone had attempted to wash away. Three fires had been started throughout the ship using diesel, but none of them had taken hold. The ship bore traces of fierce fighting, the captain's cabin had been ransacked and damaged, the ship's cash machine lay empty on the floor, and pieces of hair, skin and a scalp fragment were found scattered around the ship. Allegedly, the ship's crane was used to retrieve the dead from below deck to deposit them in the sea. The only trace of any of the missing was a picture of Heinrich and Barbel's daughter left on a desk, until September 14, 1993 when Heinrich's body was found by Dutch fishermen. None of the other missing men have ever been found. Lappin allegedly weighed them down with scrap iron and threw them overboard. Lappin initially refused to get into the rescue helicopter dispatched for him, and was reported to have been totally calm and unworried about his situation, which would be hard to believe considering he had spent at least two days adrift in the North Sea hundreds of nautical miles from land. Is it possible that he really had witnessed the events as he said they had occurred and was traumatized as a result? Or was he busy concocting his story when he was found? According to the Abendblatt, Lappin had his duvet, pillows, his former Red Army passport, six cans of peaches, some cola and two suitcases with papers and documents, as well as 60,000 Deutsche Marks and sailors' wages and Heinrich's savings, which Lappin claimed was his own savings meant to buy a car. Perhaps most damningly, Barbel claimed that Lappin was wearing Heinrich's watch when rescued. But if his motive was robbery, why escalate to five counts of murder during a short journey where it would be quickly noticed if you were already confident enough to escape in a life raft? Lappin's initial story told to the Danish investigators was that he had saved himself from a fire whilst the other crew members were drowning. This later changed to a dispute over pay and working conditions between Heinrich and the sailors. He alleged that two mutinous sailors had used an axe to kill Heinrich and two other sailor, and threatened him, whereby Lappin killed them both in self-defense. As he feared no one would believe his story, he decided to dispose of all the evidence, and took the money to give to the families of the missing men. Lappin was charged with arson and five counts of murder on the August 19th. 1993 and deported to Germany from Denmark on December 13, 1993, Lappin's initial trial began on September 5, 1994. He refused to talk to German authorities before his trial yet turned up to his hearings at Osnabrück District Court smartly dressed, and answered all questions put to him. 
his story changed again at his trial. Now Lappin and the ship's helmsman had teamed up to investigate what happened to the captain, and upon finding him dead in the ship's workshop after being attacked by the other sailors aboard the ship. Lappin managed to escape, but the helmsman had not been so lucky, as he was caught and killed by a team of mutinous sailors. After witnessing the killers fight with and overpower the chef on deck, Lappin hid at the bottom of a ladder to allow him to pick them off one by one. After dispatching them both with axes, he attempted to dispose of the evidence and then tried to navigate the barbel to shore but couldn't operate the ship. His first story of a fire breaking out was a lie because he was afraid no one would believe him and that he was telling the truth this time. On February 3, 1995, Lappin left the courtroom a free man to the lack of evidence against him. He was allowed to keep the 60,000 DM as he now claimed he had made it selling traditional religious Russian icons. On July 30, 1996, the Bundesgerichtshof, German Federal Court of Justice, the highest court dealing with ordinary criminal charges, announced that no further action would be brought against Lappin. The missing crew consisted of Engineer Mikhail Mikhailov, Sailor Vladislav Bogdan, First Mate Viktor Varenko and Chef Anatoly Smolajak. Their families still have not had closure to this day. However, even if we presume that Lappin was lying about acting in self-defense, there are numerous issues around the case. The timings of the ship's intended journey time, Sunday morning to evening, and the fact that Heinrich did not answer Barbel's call on Monday, means that whatever happened to the crew probably took place on Sunday, August 15th, according to Danish investigators almost certainly within 48 hours of the ship departing London. Although it seems most likely that Lappin was responsible for both the disappearances of Heinrich and the crew, as well as the attempted arson, this timeline for his plan makes little sense. Why take on five other sailors and the captain of the ship when the ship has barely left port, rather than waiting until the ship was nearer the destination? Given that Lappin was hired on the August 9th, why not rob the ship while it waited at London between the 10th and 15th and escape with the cash then? Lappin almost certainly lied about taking the money to give to the families as he kept it, but that doesn't mean he killed five other men to get hold of it. It should be noted that Lappin came from Kaliningrad, a small Russian exclave on the Baltic Sea bordering Poland and Lithuania, so it's possible that he thought he could sail the ship through the North Sea, through the Danish Straits and closer to home with no training. Although he claimed in court that he tried to navigate the ship, surely it would make sense to learn to sail a ship of barbel size before trying it. Even if that was Lappin's plan, it would rely on him being able to kill five men without one of them fighting back enough to injure or kill Lappin and prevent him from escaping. Regardless of what actually happened that fateful August, the exact series of events and the reasons behind them remain a mystery today. After his acquittal, Lappin applied for a job on the barbel through Heinrich's wife, who now owned the ship. He did not get the job. Reporters with Danish radio later tracked down Lappin in Russia in 2009. In what may seem a fitting end for a story where little makes sense, he found work as a middle manager at a sea rescue station. The barbel itself still operates today, under various names and owners since 1993. With Lappin the only survivor, the ship itself is the sole other witness. With neither able or willing to talk, what exactly happened that summer will probably never be known, and will almost never make total sense. What do you think took place that weekend in the North Sea? In 1930, 16-year-old Park Chansu is beaten to death on the side of a mountain. His murderers are soon caught and his body is returned to his mother. Six months later, Park Chang-soo appears in front of her doorstep alive. But then who is the boy in the grave with his name? The Case On April 29, 1930, a woman in Yankian village of Japanese-occupied Korea set out from her house to the nearby hills to gather greens. She found more than that. The Japanese police were deployed to the scene. They found the body of a teenager who had been beaten so badly that his body was filled with bruises and his face was unrecognizable. Next to him was a small towel and an A-frame, it's like an AC frame that you can sling on your back. 
the body was transported to a local hospital and autopsy revealed the cause of death to be suffocation. The police theorized that the towel had been used to strangle him. At the time, the area was the epitome of rural countryside. Murders did not happen in Yankian. Even thefts were rare. But now, the police were tasked with identifying the victim and the perpetrator. For two days, the police asked around the village if anyone had gone missing within the past week. There was one. A teenager named Park Chang-soo. Park Chang-soo worked as a laborer for a local inn. He had been missing since April 26 and on the morning of April 26, the innkeeper Ko Okadan and another laborer, Cho ki Jun, was seen beating Park with a switch. Park had not been heard from since. Ko and Cho were immediately arrested. Ko denied the accusations completely but after two days of interrogation, very likely employing human rights violations in the contemporary view, Cho admitted to the murder. The following is a summary of Cho's confession. The innkeeper Ko was the second wife of a rich man named Han Baekwon, who lived in a village over. As Han's first wife was jealous and did not want Ko under the same roof, Ko was given allowance to set up an inn in Kian. Ko was in her early twenties at the time and supposedly, she was popular with the men. When a man named Lee Kimon asked her to run away with him, instead of declining him, she asked him for time to think. For whatever reason, Park told Han and Han reprimanded Ko. Furious, Ko conspired to kill Park. With Cho, they took Park to the mountains at night, beat him and strangled him with the towel. Ko eventually confessed to the murder as well but recanted during the hearing. The judge sentenced the repentant Cho to 10 years and Ko to 15 years. In the meantime, the police had located Park's mother. When asked if the body was Park Chang Su, Park's mother confirmed his identity. She mentioned that the clothes were different but that it was her son. Their job done, the police handed the body over to Park's mother. And the case should have ended there. The twist. On October 18, 1930, Park showed up on his mother's doorstep and upon seeing him, his mother accused Park of being a ghost. It turned out that while Ko and Cho had taken him to the mountain to beat him, he didn't die. He passed out. When he woke up, he was understandably reluctant to return to the inn and instead, walked to another village where he worked as a laborer for a household. So if Park was alive, who was in the grave bearing his name? Understandably, everyone was confused. Two people had been sentenced for a murder and yet, their victim was alive. The Aftermath Immediately, the blame game began. The prosecutors pointed their fingers at the police. The police blamed the victim's family for being unable to recognize Park. So why didn't Park's mother recognize him? By the time Park's supposed corpse had arrived in his mother's village, he had been dead for a week. His face was unrecognizable. And as the saying went in those days, the Japanese police will take you if you cause mischief. Even if she had known it wasn't her son, Park's mother was unlikely to have gone against the word of the police. Also, if the police had paid better attention to her comment on his clothes, they might have kept it as evidence. However, they handed the clothes and the body over to the victim's family and with that, the two clues to the teenager's identity was lost. As for Ko and Cho, they were innocent of the murder of Park. But, because the case was still open, the Japanese prosecutor, Matsumoto, expressed reluctance for a retrial. The presiding judge at the time, Hasebi, acknowledged the wrong judgment but stated that his hands were tied unless the prosecutors asked for a retrial. Eventually, both Ko and Cho were granted a retrial. Both testified that they made false confessions under the brutal police investigation and both were released. Ko and Cho would later go on to request reparations. However, as no such laws existed at the time for Japanese Imperial Penal Code, their request was struck down. Park enjoyed a modest fame afterwards. The body discovered in Yankian has never been identified. Thank <laughs> you.